today on This Weekend Startups. Mikhail Savanu is here. He's the founder of Zendesk. He's making bank. Another hungry entrepreneur wades into the shark tank. And Tyler delivers us some fascinating insights. All that and more on This Weekend Startups. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. But funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Oh, welcome to another This Week in Startups. I am so happy. Wow, we're going to have a great show today, huh, Tyler? Can I go a, on a tangent? we got a great guest today. We have an amazing guest. But let's not get to that yet. Let me go on a little bit of a tangent here. Go, go for it. Because you're, you're from the Diego. Yes. I'm reading, I'm, you know, sometimes I get a little OCD about stuff. And you know the issue I'm going to bring up. No, I don't. Oh, you weren't oh, watching me at? SeaWorld. Yeah, SeaWorld. Yeah. So at midnight last night, yes. I can't sleep, you know. Uh-huh. And... I just, you know, I'm just thinking about, for some reason, a sea world comes into my mind. Okay. And I type in a Google News search. Okay. And for whatever reason, on the 24th, the day that launch ended, the day that Google smacked down all the content farms and Mahalo got its ass kicked, uh, it's brutal. We're working on it. We're working on it. Um, SeaWorld announces with this corny PR person, we're getting back in the water, and we're going to be doing this great, awesome, spectacular. There's fountains, and the orcas are going to be jiving in the fountains, and da da da, da And we'll see you all at SeaWorld this spring for Oceans United. And i got to show you this. Like, it's like SeaWorld Oceans uh, United. And I, I couldn't believe it because they're putting people in the water a year after the trainer was killed. Yeah. What a way to celebrate. Are they? I do get like some really good pay. Is that like hazardous pay? If you get this. Well, interesting. Thing? You say that. So, they, um, the Sea World people. I'm looking at Gadling. By the way, it's, it was a weblog thing. Property Gadling. Yeah. And I named that domain. Talk about a great domain name. Eight ninety five. I paid for that one, and it means a, a wandering rag of, vagabond. I love that name, Gadling. Anyway, Sea World prepares to put trainers back in the water. And look at this. Like, they're such dopes. Like, that's their logo. Like, it looks like the Cove. It doesn't look like the Cove DVD it cover. almost does, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, oh, look, we're going to put people. See the people's hands there? We're going to put them back in the water to be killed. And this woman is such a knucklehead in this. It's Julie Scredana. I don't know how much they're paying her to sell her soul. But she basically gets on here, and she's like, oh, my God, it's the greatest thing ever, and we're going to be back in the water. Look at her. Oh, and these orcas. And it's like... These orcas are incredible, and you're going to love them, and you're going to, it's just great. The orcas are going to grab the trainer, pull them under, rip their arm out of the socket, and then not give the dead trainer back for 30 minutes. And OSHA fined them for gross negligence. And now they're trying to, the, the bastards at SeaWorld are trying to seal the court papers that is coming up. Oh. Now, if you're training orcas and, like, you would think that this information would be transparent. Like, hey, if this trainer was mauled to death yes. in the pool, had her arm ripped out of her socket in front of 10,000 people or whatever it was, uh, about the same number of people who subscribe to Zendesk. And, <laughs> what a segue. <laughs> um, and wow. 10,000 people yeah. watched this woman. They couldn't get the poor trainer out of the orca's mouth for 30 years. Minutes. It took 30 minutes to get the orca distracted. Yeah, it's an orca. It's not like a. All the orca's teeth, if you go on this type of orca teeth, all their teeth are broken. You know why? Because yeah. they're in pens next to each other oh, and yeah. they rip their teeth out yeah, yeah. trying to get out and they bang into each other and get aggressive. Average lifespan of an orca, nine years. In the wild, it's like 30. You couldn't do anything more evil than put these poor creatures in a tiny pool, let themselves rip their own teeth out bang into each other. Into, some of them have died in captivity from banging into each other so hard. They're so frustrated. They just run into each other, which they don't do in the wild, well, the, it's and break each other's jaws yeah, and bleed to death in the pool. They bleed out in the goddamn pool. Yeah. It is tragic. And they're not even paying these poor trainers. Like These trainers have like a union rep. They're not even getting paid minimum wage, according to some of these rumors. So they're putting people in there for six, seven bucks an hour because they know they love these orcas. <laughs> and these poor trainers are so misguided. You know, it's like these weird hoarders who hoard animals on their property. That's what these trainers are. They just have, you know, happen to have a trainer. 
Anyway. <laughs> He's on the uh, land, folks. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, you know, I, what's, the, what's the use of having a platform like this if I can't at least speak my mind when I'm so So I think what you're doing this? is you're telling the audience, please, somebody Don't. start a company where I can effectively champion change against organizations like SeaWorld. If somebody could do that, yes. If somebody had like a squeal where I could squeal on SeaWorld, like I could just email like, hey, I'm at SeaWorld right now. I don't know if you are aware, but there are four orcas in tanks here, and I just, I, I can't take it. Can, can I get a free coupon to get the orcas out? I'll squeal it. Yeah. Anyway, my first guest, my <laughs> only guest, oh, God, uh, is here. And Mikhail, um, you are the founder of Zendesk, and you built this um, in Denmark, of all places, uh, and then brought it here to the U.S., and it's tremendously successful, 10,000 subscribers. It's a beautiful, beautiful product. Incredible uh, companies like Groupon, Sony, Zappos, I mean, Rackspace. I mean, this is the A-list of A-lists. And uh, from what we understand, tens of thousands of users or something to that effect. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you. Sorry about the whole Orca rant. <laughs> I just, I don't know how you feel about it, but it's, it's like, it's so tragic. <laughs> well. He's like, what am I doing here? <laughs> what, what did my PR yes. people do? <laughs> they put me on these shows, you maniacs talking about orcas. Let's talk more about whales. <laughs> really? I mean, you're from Denmark, you should have some appreciation of whales. Oh I mean, my, oh no, you're going to get on this whole thing now. Because of, well, Gre I, because of Greenland or what? No, because it's, there's a big ocean there and there's a ton of whales in that ocean. I'm not, I'm not talking about the slaughter of pilot whales in... It's not Denmark, is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I, see this, I knew you were going here. This is the worst show ever. I know. I should just give up now. I just want to tell everybody, please use Dendesk. Thank you for coming. That's uh, actually the national dish in Denmark. That's baby whales. You're kidding. Yes. It is? No. I'm oh, kidding. Oh, God. I, I mean, the Japanese are like, hey, let's eat some tuna. Let's eat some dolphin. Let's eat some whatever. Anyway. Um, before we get started, let me tell you about something amazing. MailChimp, MailChimp, MailChimp. Uh, upgrade to their free plan. It's a wild show. It's a wild show. Yes. MailChimp, they don't keep chimps in captivity or orcas. Um, <laughs> they uh, will give you up to 2,000 subscribers for free, and I use the product. We only allow products on the show, as you know, that I personally use. And MailChimp was one of those products that I was using for a while, and they decided to sponsor. And uh, they just redesigned their site. It is gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous now. And they've uh, integrated Amazon's new um, transactional email. So if you're into that, you can use it. And hey, if you sign up for MailChimp right now and you forward your registration to contests at this weekend, if you forward to contests at this weekend your sign up, what you do is sign up. It doesn't cost you anything. You get that email back. I will pick the, I don't know, 10 people between now and the next episode, and I'll give them one of the This Week in Bags. And that's, those bags cost like 25 bucks or something, and they're gorgeous, and you cannot buy them. So go ahead, sign up for MailChimp, take a look at it, um, and forward us the sign-up form at contests at This Week in, and we'll put you into a drawing to get one of those 10 free bags. Mmm, you want it. So tell me, why did you create Zendesk, and when? So I just want to say we use MailChimp too. It's an awesome product. It is, isn't it? Yes, it and it's is. like there's a whole class of products like yours and theirs yeah. they, they, that you can just sign up for the same day. There is a similarity. I mean, they do very, very different things, but the kind of intelli the, the, the simplicity and elegance and... Elegantly simple yet yes. complex? Well, mm. very powerful, but yet made very simple mm. and very elegant. And I think there's a similarity too in that it's all about customer engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where they're very proactive, reaching out marketing-wise in, in their product, where Zendesk is very much about retrieving all the feedback and all the support requests and all that stuff you get after sending these campaigns, for That's example. That's a good point. They're almost, right. almost like a yin-yang. Yeah. Like one is all about out and one is all about yeah, out. Yeah. I actually like... have an affair with Ben from MailChimp. Mm. Really? Yes. That's oh. just a disturbing, distur I mean, you have the <laughs> same glasses, too. I mean, it's a disturbing, <laughs> disturbing movie right there. Um, okay. <laughs> This is going to go down in history as the most bizarre show. It will. Um, I can feel it, yeah. we, we just aired this on April 1st. Uh, so uh, when did you start Zendesk? So we launched the Zendesk October 2007. It was right around the first TechCrunch 50 event. Right, and you guys applied. Yes, we did. And you didn't get in. No. And it is the biggest mistake we've I, ever made. We always say that. Bitching judges. I, I, well, the funnier <coughs> was... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Tyler's getting, he's so upset. I'm so it's okay, Tyler. <laughs> but It's he, over. It was four years ago. You can let when, it go. When he initially emailed, your response was rather critical. Was it? And rather skeptical of the entire <laughs> really? proposition. Oh, yeah. I was like, I can pull it up. I'm sure he remembers it. What did I say? Oh, no, we, we had a very pleasant phone conversation. We had a pleasant phone conversation, but I think people were, I think the few, if I remember correctly, it was, this is a very simple thing, and it's maybe not that groundbreaking. 
and I think that we've learned over time in the last four years, simple products done well change uh, the world. But I think also what, what we've seen since 2007 is then back in 2007 when we started building this product, uh, help desk, customer service, customer support, it was all like it was the bottom feeders. It was a cost center. Right. And nobody really wanted to spend time on it, only if you really, really had to. Right. Um, and suddenly we, and, and I think today, I think most products are built where service and support is an integral part of the service. It's a part of the value proposition. Right. And people build the product around the service and the support they can offer. Right. So the, the, the tides have really changed in how people appreciate and use these kind of products. And it's changed in terms of just how they look at customer support. I mean, it was something that you outsourced, yeah. and it was a cost center and an annoyance. Hmm. And then Zappos, they really give them credit, actually, yes. with changing, at least here in the United States, the view of, hey, if you can get on the phone with your customer, that's a good thing. Hmm. You should cherish that moment. Yeah. Um, and so you launch the product in 2007. You build it. Uh, in Denmark, and then at some point it starts to get a lot of attention. Yes. And you decide to move to the U.S. or you get funding in the U.S. What happened? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so we go very actively after getting funding in the U.S. to get the company over here. Right. Because, uh, you know, that's a big difference between building a company, in, a technology company in Europe and building it in, in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S. and in California. Right. It, you can do it. It's definitely possible, but it's you know, it's so much easier and so much better to do it here. What's easier? So access, access, access. yeah, to guys like you, ah. to, uh, to money, to right. talent, to buzz, to the right people, to everything. Interesting. So what I, what I don't hear in there is, uh, I mean, you just say a little bit about talent, but most of the things you're saying, buzz, access, money, it's actually, you, it, it is possible to build a great product in Europe. And we see a lot of great products start there and get built there. But there's something about getting investment and getting buzz and getting Robert Scoble and this person to pay attention and mm. TechCrunch that doesn't happen in Europe. No, but there's, there's definitely not that concentration of money, talent, and you know, all that stuff. There's not that concentration of everything in the same place as you see here in California. So it's easier. Everything is easier. But it basically, everything flows a little bit easier, which means that you can spend more time on the actual building of the product. Is that what it comes down to? I think it's like if, you've, if you're ambitious around your product, if you want to take it all the way, if, uh, if you don't have a ceiling, if you want to think really, really big, you know. Just move. Yeah. Exactly. That's your advice. Yeah. And that's Luik's advice as well. And, you know, people get very upset yeah. at you guys about this. Do people in Denmark feel you're a trader? No, no. People in Paris feel that Luik's, Luik's a trader or no? Tyler? But the French. Oh. Well, the French, yes, I know. I, I, listen, I... Once again, I love the French. I love creme anglaise, <laughs> pain au chocolat. I had a croque monsieur this past weekend at the Four Seasons, delicious with the egg on the top. I love that. I love French. I love French people. I love French food. It's, I'm a Francophile, you would say. And I'm not going to bring up the war. <laughs> or the airspace, because that's just a hot potato. Uh, or Luik being a traitor, for that matter. Um, but you had no problem doing it. You're thinking about yourself, your family, your team. You want to be in the best place to have success. Why not New York? Did you think about that? Uh, so that's definitely a big difference between the East Coast and the West Coast for the tech industry. Yeah. I think there's a lot of stuff, interesting stuff happening in New York. There's also a lot of interesting stuff happening in Boston. Right. But it's, you know, the scale is not the same at all. Right. So you wanted to be really successful with this. So you said, let me just go to the heartland. Let me get right yeah. where it's at yeah. and, and go from there. Um, so when you come to the U.S., you start meeting with VCs. Yes. And what is that first round of uh, meetings like, coming in and saying, like, hey, I want to move a company here, I want to do a, um, you know, a support desk, what they would consider enterprise computing back in the day, but now mm. it feels like it's less enterprise because it's more fun and has a good logo. Yeah. Um, what, what was the reaction? Were they just like, this is too simple? Or were they just like, this is brilliant, it's like 37 signals? Mm. How, how did they qualify it? So we, we raised our Series A during the nuclear war. Uh, nuclear winter of the, of oh, the venture capital industry. So it was a very stressful period. Was it 2008, 2009? Uh, so, so we announced it in January 2009, I think, uh, or March or something like that. So right. that's. So, wow, you're going to them when they were all shell shocked. Yeah, yeah. And they're taking the meetings, though? The VCs were taking meetings? Yeah, so we did a lot of meetings. We got a lot of good feedback. Mm -hmm. It was still like people were still, this was very new for them. Right. And, uh, you know, basically nobody had defined that industry yet. We were the mm -hmm. first to complete it, disrupt it. Right. Um, so, you know, people were cautious about us. Mm -hmm. um, you had customers at the time? Oh, yeah, yeah. How, got, how many customers were you running at that time? The hundreds, thousands? Uh, it was, so we, when we had us, when we made our Series A announcement, we announced 
1,000 customers at the same time. So you're not coming in there with nothing. You got, hey, 50,000 no, no. a month in revenue or something like that. You're almost at a million dollars a year run rate. <clears throat> yeah, I can't remember the numbers. But something like that. So they, they must be taking you somewhat seriously. Oh, you yeah, got yeah. 10 employees or something? Oh, yeah. We got great, great feedback. You know, I was very, um, you know, I was humbled by the feedback and by the great talent we met. So definitely. Um, and so you convinced one of them to uh, do it during that time. Who yeah. was it? That was Charles River. Ah, um, and, George uh, Zachary. No, actually, it, it, it's an East Coast partner, Devdot Yalaka. Ah. And basically, Devdot, uh, I had a phone call with him. He said, well, I'm coming by. So he came next morning to Copenhagen, sat down with us all day, and we worked from this little loft. Uh, you know, on fifth floor, and he had to walk all the way up, and uh, we just sat there all day. Uh, he took the plane home in the evening. Wow. Yeah. He did a one-day trip to Denmark. Yes. What did we do? It was a two-day trip. Yeah. We did a two-day trip. We were dead. Yeah. This is dedication. I mean, yeah. for a VC to get on a plane yes. that's longer than an hour yeah. is... I, I mean, did you call Guinness Book of World Records and <laughs> no. let them know that a VC had actually flown to see a company? No, but I mean, they never go. For, I mean, it's like they never go see the companies. I have VCs email me all week. Yeah. Oh, Jason, we love your product. We want to talk to you. And I was like, great, come by. Yeah. Ah, you know, we. If you could come by, that would be great. Then the assistants email you. Oh, you know, he's got a backed up schedule. Can you come up here? And I'm just like, no. Yeah. I'm waiting. I want you to love me. So they <laughs> flew out there. That made you feel great. Yeah, but that made us also very confident in Charles River and basically yeah. made us go with them for our Series A. Did you put that on the funded? Did you put that story on the funded? No. Nope. You should, you should yeah. go put it on the funded. I mean, that's yeah. a great story. That's the exact opposite of the story that I told, where I went up to the valley to meet with the VC, as but, of because my friend wanted me to meet with them, and then they canceled on me <laughs> while I was landing at the airport. Great. Can you imagine that if that's you canceled awesome. on him when he landed in yeah, uh, Copenhagen? Fantastic, fantastic. But anyway, tell me some more about it. Unpack the. Uh, no, no, that, that just made us very confident in them, and, and uh, so it's a public story. I told you before, there's no reason to behind, uh, hide it behind a paywall at the funded. Yeah, right. Uh, but it's, uh, and it's been great working with Charles River. We did our Series B very quickly after that. Once we had kind of transferred the company, made the flip, uh, had all the IP over here, starting right. hiring people, getting some executives on board, uh, we really ran into a lot of people who wanted to invest. So we did our Series B right after that. How many months? Three months, four months, five months, six so months? So in terms of announcement, so five months after we announced CSA, we did our Series B. Five months? Yep. And did people tell you too soon? Were the investors like, hey, maybe it's not a good idea? Or were you like, hey, the market's coming back. No. We're hot. We're going to close now. No, we were like, you know, we had an opportunity to work with a lot of very good companies then. We, we, we went with the Benchmark and Peter Fenton. And Benchmark's every, another amazing firm. Exactly. And everybody was like, let's just do that. If, if, if Benchmark is behind it, Peter Fenton is behind it, uh, we were working with Matt Kohler, too, who's an awesome guy. Yeah. Everything was just like, let's just do it. So when you make a decision like that, what I heard in both of those stories were very partner-based. The partner's as important as the firm, correct? The, I think the partners are more important than the firm. Right. Because you may get a partner at a firm who may be, let's face it, you know, it's not like... Somebody has to play left field. I mean, not, that's a baseball reference. I don't know if everybody gets it. But, yeah. So I think the different VCs yeah. are very different constructed right. in that way. Yeah. So you want to get a great partner at that firm. And so I'm guessing you do like a standard $10, $12 million valuation for the first one. How do you approach a quick funding after that and justifying what had to be at least double the valuation to make the A round happy? Does, did Benchmark not have a problem with it? How, how did you so reconcile it, we, it without, so you know, if you don't want to give details, you don't have to, but obviously there has to be a significant jump between those two things. Sure, and we were happy with that. Uh, and so Benchmark offered it? They were just like, hey, we're going to do that? Or did you say what your goal was? How, do, how does an entrepreneur go about doing that in a short, so, short round? So know, we were also short like, time between rounds. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we were, we, we, I think we rely a lot on the people we, uh, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we have around us and... Yeah. Uh, we had a, a brilliant uh, uh, angel investor, uh, Christoph Jans, who was the founder of PageFlakes. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, he advised us along the way. And, we, you know, it just turned out to be a deal that everybody loved. So. Yeah. Generally speaking, as an entrepreneur, when you can raise money in an up round from an investor that you respect and who adds value, your advice is... Uh, well, I think there's more criteria to it than that, but, you know, sure. Uh, I mean, you, those are the big, sh what's the next criteria? I mean, if after can, that, it's an up if, round with a great investor. What more do you need? Yeah, and if you can get to work with great people, that's, you know, that can mean so much for your company. What, what, what would be your criteria after that? You have great, you know, good, good to great valuation and great partner. I mean, what else do you think about when you're picking an investor? And, and uh, uh, picking a deal. 
Yeah, you want to think about that track record. You want to uh, see, you know, you want to see what they've done before. Mm -hmm. You want to get an idea about how they work, and um, you want to get an idea about. I think there's many things to it. You have to spend a little time together. It's like, it's a little bit like dating. You know? Yeah, just spend a little time together. Take the time, and how, how does that actually occur? The spending of the time together. Do you just stay, come by the office, and hang out for a couple of hours, meet the team. Yeah, that's a lot go to, to it. Dinner. You go, you go out, you have some beers, you have, you have a dinner, you yeah. go get some wine, and you, you, you know, you have to talk a lot, yeah. take some walks. Yeah. Is it different in Europe than it is in the United States? The United States seems very transactional. Europe seems very relationship-based. Is, is it a different style of business, do you think? It's, yeah, you can't compare. It's so, so small. You know, the VC market in, in, in Europe, is like, it's, it's pitiful. You know? yeah. In Denmark, it's non-existing almost. So I right. don't know. I can't, I can't tell about it. I, know, I don't know. What about anything. general business style? I mean, it seems much more social and relationship-based in Europe, or maybe that's just my perception. Um, I think is it there, is. I yeah. think it is, but it's, to some extent, it's true. It, it is true here in, your, in California, yeah. no doubt about it. The relationships mean a lot. You know, if you know people well, if you know how to how they work, if you know, you know how they perform and so on, they are much easier bet than somebody you don't know. So, right. relationships always mean a lot. So, uh, the product is very elegant and beautifully designed with an incredible name. Um, how important are those factors? Great domain name, great design. Uh, and great UX in terms of the success of a software as a service, a so SaaS product. I don't think you can separate that anymore. You know, the design is your product, the brand is your product. It uh, is one thing. Yeah, because you know, traditional enterprise sales, you could, you always sold to somebody else than the guys who actually use the product. Right. And and nowadays that has just completely changed. You know, with the consumerization of IT, you know, you're selling to the people who are actually using the product. Wow, that is a really interesting so, insight. So so the design and how stuff works and how it looks and how it feels and all that stuff is it, is is as relevant in the product as anything else. Right. And do you guys actually, you know, sell as an organization? Are you do you have salespeople out there like? Meeting with people, or is it just like come to the website, see how beautiful it is, try it, and buy it? What's what's the percentage? Until two months ago, we had no salespeople in our organization. Wow, tens yeah. of thousands of customers, millions of dollars in revenue, and no salespeople. All through that little screen that you see everywhere now, the 37 signals pricing design screen. It's like start a regular plus. They really pioneered something with that. Oh yeah, so I think the world has a lot to to. Uh, you know, owes a lot to 37 Signals. Uh, the world owes a lot to Salesforce. There's a lot of pioneers in this field that really made, wait, made, uh, made this possible. And now you see it in on the App Store, on the Mac Store, and all these places like simplified pricing, uh, uh, payable pricing, no enterprise pricing anymore. Cancel any time, no yes. contracts. Yes. Yeah, it's just like every objection that people have, you just take out because you're so confident that your product's best that you're gonna win. Yeah, and it's also a realization of that we're all consumers, you know. Uh, to unpack that, for, what do you mean? So when you buy, when you buy uh, services or software for your company mm. or for your companies, yeah. uh, you buy them as, as a consumer. You think about the price, you try to get a deal and all that stuff. You buy as a consumer rather than right. as an enterprise. So we're all consumers. Right, so you have to think about that individual person and what's going through their cognitive process. Sure. They're taking out their corporate credit card, but yep. they're on the line for it. So yep. they're looking at a screen like this. Pull up my screen, guys. Uh, $9 per agent per month for the basic. Uh, domain map, but that's only up to three agents, so that's going to be a very small enterprise company, like maybe 25 or less people in the company maybe. Regular $29 a month, and plus $69, $59 a month if you, buy, if you pay for the year 49. Mm. Um, Real-time alerts, data portability, analytics, 24-hour phone support. And the way you separate how did you decide what goes into each column here? Has this changed over time, or is it just like the domain mapping and support are just the things that you know? There's some people who will pay for support, and there's some people who don't want to pay for it. Some people want domain mapping, some yeah. people don't. And you just I think the first criteria is that we try to define who is actually the who is actually ah. using the different types of products and right. figure out what's the most important thing for them. Got it. And figure out to have that out of the box ready and everything, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, 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 you know, working with all of it. But it's a constant, it's a constant process. We constantly right. need to optimize our offerings for the, for the different markets. Right. This first one here, the $9, mm. is like the too good to be true pricing, right? That's just to get somebody in the system? Yeah, but that, that enables everybody, you know, and that's really part of democratizing this space. It just enables everybody to go out and set up fully professional support services from day one. Yeah. 
So whether you're building, whatever shop you're building, whatever your budget is, you can always go out and set, set up fully support, fully professional support services from day one. We had that happen with Salesforce. They gave us like a $500 a month six seat license. And I'm like, how is this possible? And they're mm. like, it's only six seats. Yeah. And when you get your seventh, then it turns into 3000 a month. <laughs> the, the jump between the two is extraordinary. Yeah, it's not um, that bad with us. But, uh, but uh, at, you know, at a, it's two and a half times. But mm. even two and a half times, it, is the uh, concept that if I get to this point, I must be doing good as a company? I, I can afford it. When you when you have more than three agents that are working with support and so on, well, you know, spend a coffee lots and less, and you know, you <laughs> you can afford it. You know? Right. Um, and so, uh, how many people at the company now? So we can close to. I think we're just we're around seventy five people right now. Seventy five people. Yeah, and most of the most of our guys are here in San Francisco. Wow. We have, of course, we have people all over the world because our customers are all over the world. Ah. So we have people in Australia, New Zealand, we have people in Hong Kong, people in uh, South America, and we have an office in London. Wow. So you're internationalizing the, the, the company and the product. <laughs> so We're international by default, actually, because yeah. if you're English speaking. Yeah. But so our biggest markets are definitely the English speaking countries, but uh, we are doing more and more international. Uh, have you translated the product yet? Not the, not the back-end system, but the product that you put to your customers, yeah. the self-service portal, the knowledge base, the FAQs, the support community, and they all of that. They support all languages. They support all languages. So as you think about now in year four of your company and you know, uh, tens of thousands of customers internationalizing, mm. how do you go about internationalizing the software? Because you know, I guess Facebook did a really interesting thing of crowdsourcing it. Yeah. Uh, it seems like there's some, I, I got pitched on a crowdsourcing uh, software as a service. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the name of that company is, but you may have heard about it. Um, and There's a lot of interesting companies in that space. Well, yeah. So yeah. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Have you done so, your research? Yeah. So on the front end, as I told you, the, all the front end of the application, the customer facing uh, part of the application is uh, fully uh, localizable. And that was actually through a crowdsourced effort. So everybody can come in and submit their variation or their mm -hmm. language to it. So we have So your customers did it? Yes, we did. We crowdsourced it, basically. Yeah. And we Customer sourced it? Back then, yeah. Back then, we, uh, we built that ourselves. Yeah. So uh, what, what should a company, a SaaS company specifically, think about when internationalizing? What, do, what, do you, what are you focused on? How do you pick which market to go to next? Yeah. So I would say go after the easiest one at the start, you know, and the, the easiest market is always the U.S. because it's so big, it's so forward thinking, it's so uh, quickly to adopt new technology mm. and so on. So go after the U.S. first of all, and then go after the other English speaking markets, take the U.K., take Australia and so on. That's definitely the easiest thing to go around it. Yeah. Then there is a lot of other interesting markets. We're seeing a lot of traction in Germany. Uh, 100 million German speakers? Yeah, exactly. Um, and when you start to uh, approach these markets, you have to think about that it's not only a question about having the software in that language, you also need the support staff and uh, the sales yes. staff and the documentation and the website and the white papers and everything. And so what are you looking at, language. like five people to open up an office in Germany, ten people? What do you, how do you, how do you Yeah, so it? we would probably not open an office directly, but... Yeah. but uh, Put a salesperson there working out of their home. Uh, not, I don't even think so. <laughs> but, but you just hire uh, some person off of Craigslist in Germany to work in the support forums. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But you, you need, but you need, you need, the, you need the language representation on all these levels. And I think that I think actually Twitter is one of these companies that have a lot of relevant experience with suddenly how to how to support all these different uh, right. uh, countries with very little staff, and they're very good at it. How do they do it? So okay. they, uh, they got, uh, I, say, I think they've set up a Japanese office now. Yeah. But I think they're attracting talent here in San Francisco that speaks multi, uh, uh, several languages. So you do it in the home office so that they are not like some, I don't know, stepchild. Yeah. That's at least their model. And I think it seems to work well. That's a great idea. I've been thinking about it with Mahalo since we're doing like all these mm. videos. Why yeah. not translate them? Mm. And if I can find somebody from Germany to translate them, they can put subtitles and they yeah. can understand the market, read the comments, and tell us what people think. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you just did the, the, the Power C round. Yes. Uh, that's very exciting. Pulled yes. down 19 million in the Series C. Wow. Who yeah. are the investors? So that's Matrix Partners and oh, with, yeah. with uh, both uh, CRV and uh, ben uh, Benchmark uh, joined. Oh, they go pro rata, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's a good sign. Uh, yeah. Almost. Or they're, they're, sometimes the VCs will participate in later rounds as a show of support, correct? Mm -hmm. Sure. And do you have to ask them to do that? Or do you? 
Or did they put it up? Did you say, hey, listen, we'll just, we'll just put a little bit in so we're on the press release? Yeah, How does so, it work? So uh, there were no need to answer. There were no need to uh, no ask, need to them, answer. Ask, ask them uh, about it. Sorry. You got you to demand it. You got to <laughs> demand it of your VCs. Listen, I'm doing a C round. That's what I do, Tyler. I, if I'm doing my next round, I need you guys to put something up. And they're like, okay, we'll give you $25. Yeah, I, I, had a great, <laughs> I had a great team to do, a, to do a really, really good C round. And we did a really good C round. Did you use a bank or did you have a process? Yeah, How did you do it? I used my, my board. Oh, the board? Yeah. She, wow, that's great. You just outsource it to the whole board. And yeah, we work together on it. So you just said, hey, you guys go meet with people, show them the deck and... No, but, you know, we had a good in. idea what we wanted to do. They have a good network. Ah, and I see. I also wanted somebody who they knew well, because you don't want to introduce new friction, new people, and blah, 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 you know. Oh, I see. So on, you're talking about on the board level. Yes. Um, so by having them bring you a pool of investors to select from, by definition, they're going to integrate in the board better. I think that it's it that if they already have a good relationship, it's much easier to build on. Right. Yeah. Why is board chemistry so important? Uh, because you don't want you you want some efficient board meetings, and you want people on the board who can help you build the company and not you know piss off the territory. What do you look for? Look to? I mean, you, you just mentioned getting the C round closed. Mm. But what is the what does the board of a very successful company like this do? Because it, it doesn't. The board's not coming into work every day. The board's not getting people to subscribe. The great product and the great designers I, I have you have. Very, I have a very active board. Uh, yeah. They really, really try to help, especially around recruiting. Ah, recruiting. Yes. Senior uh, talent. Yes. About, but also in terms of educating us, making us think bigger, you know, coming from a small country like Denmark and then have to think that you can take over the world. It's like right. it, it requires a little training. So coming from a nine million person company. Five. Oh, it's five, right. I yeah. was just thinking about um, Sweden. Norway or Sweden is nine, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so five million people, you're basically the size of San Francisco or mm. Manhattan. Mm. And now you're thinking about building a billion dollar company. I mean, that's yes. really what you're doing. You're building yes. a billion dollar company. Yes. You want to go public, perhaps be like Salesforce. Can, is, there a, is, is the market big enough in the help desk area, or do you have to, you know, expand the product? So, yes, there's two interesting angles to that. First of all, customer support, customer service is a much bigger market than traditional CRM. Correct. Yeah, so there's a very, very big market there. But the other question is, of course, what is the future of customer relationship management? Mm. To, nowadays, it's a lot about Salesforce automation. It's a lot about, you know... Sales-driven. Yeah. Um, I think that in the future you'll see more and more of CRM being focused around the customer conversations, being able to communicate and engage actively with your customers because ultimately that's what we all want. Hmm. So Get Satisfaction yes. is now a competitor, it seems. They've launched a help desk. Their company, from what I understand, was struggling, I guess. It was just sort of like if you were a customer, it was like sort of public facing. Okay. And from what I heard in the market, like doing okay, but not like a breakout success like you guys have tons of paid customers. And now they're like, hey, we're going help desk. They're, they're going to follow you. I didn't know that. I think so, yeah. Um, and so now that they want to do that, um, that's a great response, by the way. Entrepreneurs, take, uh, take note. If you want to really F with your competitors, just be like, oh, I don't, I don't know what company you're talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so how do you look at something like that, somebody coming into your space, now everybody is um, realizing that um, customer support, it, support is a model uh, so and is first viable. Of all, first of all, I have to say we love Get Satisfaction. Yes. We, have a, we have a fantastic integration with Get Satisfaction. I love Wendy. Uh, yeah. And we have a lot of customers using both Zendesk and uh, Get Satisfaction for building up a powerful uh, customer community. Yeah. Um, so uh, Maybe it's another one I'm thinking about, Tyler. Was there, what's the other big um, feedback? Oh, user voice. Sorry, I take it back. Mm. User voice. Um, which was only, I take it all back, yeah. um, user voice has now gone full service. Mm. So now they're like, hey, it's not just feedback from the audience and the audience voting up features. They're like, hey, we're going to do a support desk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, does that mean you have to do, now that they've come into your market, does that mean you have to do forward-facing public discussion boards about features? We already do that. We yeah. already have a lot of you know, uh, abilities to put uh, feature request voting, idea yeah. storms, uh, support communities on your, on your self-service. Idea portal. storms? Yeah. What, what is an idea storm? It's about crowdsourcing ideas, basically, ah. from your customers. Now, I was talking to Louis about that, and I, I don't know if he was using your software or user voice to do it, and we had an inter interesting debate. Are you educating your competitors when you publicly do a brainstorm, or is the value of the public brainstorm greater, you know, in having a public roadmap like that out there, is it greater to have that? How, how, do, you, how do you answer that question? I, had, I actually just had that conversation with uh, Thomas from yeah, uh, OneLogin. One yeah. 
uh, and I think transparency will always win. Transparency always wins. Yeah. So you do think that SeaWorld should put make all the documents public I think about their, you know, with the trainer being killed and murdered for 30 minutes in the pool? I think they will, you know, of course you have to, uh, you know, you have to, it all comes you, back you, you have to, to make, you have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> You, know, you have to make sure that you get all the angles right. Right. You know, you can't just push one angle. That's not transparency. Right. Uh, but transparency will always win. You know, uh, and and we know that. You know, we know that new competitors are spending a lot of time asking our support people, asking our people about how stuff works before they build their own. You know, and that's fine. Oh uh, right, yeah. That must be the classic case of like, yeah. well, we can build this ourselves, yeah. and you're like, yeah, or you could spend three thousand dollars with us, mm. and you can build it yourself for. I don't know, maybe a hundred thousand dollars to mm. start and have ten percent of our product, mm. and then bang your head against the wall mm. because we are launching new features every week, every yeah. month, yeah. and then you'll come back and give us the three thousand dollars, and you will have spent a hundred three thousand dollars on a help desk <laughs> when you actually should be running your store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the basic process that people go through? I don't think so. Not no. anymore. Not, Not anymore. anymore. No. Two, two, three years ago, that was the process. Yeah, I think so. Who are you up against now? Are you up against? Is it is? Because I'm sure four years ago you're up against these, you know. Tens of thousands of dollars, uh, client server software. We got to have this all in house. We can't have it in the cloud. It's too dangerous. Ha ha that objection has gone away. The the sort of like, oh yeah. my God, this is in your cloud. Or do people yeah. still feel that way? Like, well, this, this can't be in your cloud. No, that's gone away. Really, people yeah. don't get worried about that anymore. No, they're like, of course there are people, but that's not the general rule anymore. Is it like one guy at the like IT department who has this like wacky concern, and then the other nine people are like, okay, that's the wacky person. He got to talk. Let's go. No, of let's course. go buy it. <laughs> there are some reasonable concerns. The stuff you have to work around. The stuff you have to really look into and investigate and to s secure and and uh, make the customers feel comfortable around it. Yeah. But you know, it's this, the cloud market is so mature now. It's so mature. And even even large enterprises, they don't even know where the data are anymore. They, they don't even have, know. They have that data out there in the cloud somewhere already. Okay, final question. Um, when in Denmark, the brown bread sandwiches. <laughs> yeah. What are they, they called, Tyler? Smorbord. Schmore? I can't do the vowel. Smorbord? Like How do you pronounce it? Smorbord. Smorbord. <laughs> you have to say rød, rød med fløde. Smørbrød. 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 All right, hold on. I don't have a hot potato. Can I get a hot potato? Oh, you're right. If you pretend like you have something very hot, it's smug. It's smug. It's a very sexy language. Smug. 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 When you're a kid, right? You can't just come out and like learn this. Later yeah, we have a, when you're born, you have a special procedure on your tongue. Yeah, like a cliff, pa cliff yep. palate kind of thing. Yep. But seriously, do do you always know when somebody is not native speaking? It's just like obvious to you, right? I don't know. Yes, that's a yes. Okay. So the brown bread sandwiches. Yes. Um, I what is it? Ida. Ida e Davidson. Ida Davidson. Yes. Is that the best place for the brown for the smorbord? It's the most well-known place, Ida and they Davidson. have a long history, and it's a very interesting place to go. It's a couple of hundred years old, right? The restaurant or something? Hundred and fifty or something. Something like that. This gener it's gener generations and generations. It's mind blowing to go to Europe as an American mm. and go to a restaurant that's as old as your country. Like I went to the Seven Doors, Septaporte in Barcelona. It's yeah. Like, they're like. This restaurant was established in 1675 or so. Yeah. It's like a 300-year-old restaurant. You're like, yeah. wait a second, we didn't have a country. Yeah. All right, Mikhail, you have to go. Yes. You have to get back to your family yes. or your company or something. Back. Something, something. Uh, and so I will let you go. But thank you for being so honest and uh, continued success with uh, the awesome product. Yes, thank you. Thank you for um, making us better at the launch conference. Uh, at believing in young companies, because mm -hmm. I always say, like, we're going to miss some, and I can honestly say this is the, one of my greatest regrets with the conference. I think it is, Mike. Actually, the, is this the greatest that we missed? Probably. It's it's pretty much. I, I think. I, it th is. I think of a couple of others we missed, but they weren't mm -hmm. as successful. So this is our this is our big mistake. The biggest miss. Biggest miss. So um, in recognition of being the biggest miss, can I, may I ask you on air to be a judge next year? Would you do that for of me? Of course. Really? Sure. All right, so as my make good, you will be a judge at launch 2012. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, and um, let's take a little break and do our Shark Tank. Ah, yes, what an amazing, amazing interview with Mikhail and... Uh, 
He told me actually in the, during the break in the commercial yeah. that orca meat, yeah. delicious. If you get the schmorborg with the orca on it. Oh, no. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say I, that. He's I a really big, like him. You like the orca? I, no, I like Mikhail. I like him too. Yeah. You know, it's just like he's, it, you know, it's cool about it. Like if that was me and I didn't get in mm -hmm. to like whatever TechCrunch or FDA and launch, I would be like, you know, I proved it. You know, like I'd be, I would oh, be. Oh yeah, he's he's been he's way, so cool about so it. So humble, yeah. He's so can humble about it. Yeah. He's so zen about it, right? He's so living his brand. Yeah. And I love the fact that like the guy is so baller. He's raised like tens of millions of dollars. He's got millions, tens of thousands of customers, yeah. and he still wears the goddamn logo on the shirt. Great point. You know, like, yeah. and I meet these young entrepreneurs, and they're not proud of their product, and they're not just like out there pounding and pounding and saying like you must pay attention to Zendesk you must yeah. pay attention to X and I told everybody at the launch conference if you have a booth wear the shirt with your logo and your name on it go out of your some people are like oh my god I didn't get any value from the booth I'm like did you go out and tell people about your product when they're having lunch or whatever when they're walking by and say may I show you your product and get some feedback from you oh no we didn't do that well what do you think people are just gonna wander up to your booth it's a like hundred booths you gotta we gotta fight for a little bit of attention yep. there's a limited amount of attention okay but one thing we're gonna give our complete attention to and we always give our complete attention to is is there's a few MailChimp. Yeah. Wait, we did the MailChimp yeah. commercial. Already. Oh, it's, oh, it's one, only one advertiser. I'm wondering which one. I had, to, I had a perfect segue, and we only have one advertiser. But you know what? It is the advertiser I love. E -e -e -e. How do I do that? So this, there he is. No, wait, I gotta go backwards. And e -e 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 -e. I told, I told Mo 3000. He's so happy he was on the show. Oh, Jason, that was great. I was on the show. Uh, every, all of my customers, my fans, my partners, they all loved it. But they said you were too hard on me. And I'm like, listen. You are putting on a chimp outfit if you get that third insertion order. If, if you get MailChimp to renew for a third time, that means they're almost like for the year. If they do the third one, you're going to come in here with that monkey suit, and you're going to thank them and bring me the insertion order. I'll, on wear that, I'll wear that crazy monkey hat for a little splish flash. Oh, you, if you wet your beak? Yeah. I miss Lon. <laughs> I miss hey, Lon came to launch. Lon was such an integral part of the show. and he yeah. just, He's like the Jackie joke, uh, Jackie yeah. Martling of the show. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, my peak's not wet enough. <laughs> it's like, you know, Howard yeah. Stern, Jackie yeah. left the show right at the yeah. peak. Yeah. The show peaks, and this is, this, this is going to be Lon's career history. The show peaks, or start, it's starting to peak, and it's, you know, he's about to be on the ride out, and he jumps off the bus. I'm like, Lon, stay on the bus. It's getting better and better. What could I offer Lon? Should I offer Lon, like, uh, 100 to come each show? That's 100 more than I offer you. You do this for free. You got a little piece. You got a piece of the equity in this weekend. That's pretty good. I told him what you're being. All right, Ian, you're on the on the line. Uh, Ian, can you hear me on the Shark Tank? I read you five by five. Five by five, big fan. I love it. We hear you <laughs> five by five here as well. Uh, you are obviously a big fan, calling from the five six one. Where's that? Yeah, uh, that's in West Palm Beach right now. I'm in Rochester, Minnesota, though. Jesus, how do you pick your cities, kid? West Palm Beach. <laughs> that's just like the whole yeah beach scene. And then you're in Rochester, in where? Yeah. Minnesota. There's a Rochester, Minnesota. I know Rochester, New York. I don't know Rochester, yeah, Minnesota. Yeah, no, there's it's it's the colder one. The colder one. My God, Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, um, how long have you been listening to the show? Um, I think actually Gary V's episode was the Whoa. first one I heard. Way wow. back. So. So you are a super fan indeed. You have a favorite episode? Uh, it, it's funny. I, I thought about that. Sort of the correlation, I think, is the more swearing there is, it's better, and Dave not because of the swearing, but you know they're like passionate and open and stuff. Right. So, so who did you like best? Um, you know, I, I think it's probably a tie between Gary V and Thirty Seven Signals. Those were both awesome. Yeah. You know, nobody even knows David. Um, David's David name, but it's David. Han uh, Heimerner Hansen, yeah, I think is the way yes. to say it. Um, and uh, boy, 37 Signals keeps coming up in the program. Really innovative guys and probably don't get enough credit for all the hard work they've done. Uh, and sometimes maybe they get too much credit. Who knows? Um, Ian, um, you know how the Shark Tank works. You have 30 seconds. No, you have 60 seconds. I'm just kidding. You have 60 seconds in 3, 2, go. All right. Um, well, Jason, I know you're a good guy, always trying to do the right thing and stuff, but sometimes you're real busy and some stuff slips by. Like um, maybe you just had a bad week, unlucky, um, you know, maybe you just missed some volunteer work you wanted to do, or maybe you didn't see an old lady come in behind you and you slammed the door in her face or something. But no matter what the cause, OffsetMyKarma.com is here to help you. We combine the uh, 
sustainability notion of carbon offsets with good deeds and volunteer work. So for, you know, just a few dollars, five dollars to fifty dollars, depending on how serious the infraction was, we will sort of be your sponsor, go out and do some good deeds for you. It's uh, offsetmykarma.com. Let us create some good karma for you. Okay. This was a 48 second pitch. And I would say this pitch, I mean, actually, you know what? I'm going to let Tyler go first. I didn't, uh -oh. I didn't catch the pitch. Sorry. Really? Yeah. That's very honest of you, Tyler. Yes. You, what happened? You just got an email or something like that? Yes. You literally got distracted. Yes. So I'm going to have to have you close your laptop. Yes. Please close your laptop. I'm going to watch on the screen. Close the laptop. I'm sorry. The guy's, the guy's waited his whole life to be on the show. we got to <laughs> give him his due. He didn't, I'm not mad at you. I know you're CEO of Wheel now. He, he didn't capture my imagination. No, no. You're CEO of Wheel. You're distracted. You're distracted. <laughs> Go ahead. Admit you're distracted. I was totally distracted. All right. So, Ian, I'm going to give you a second shot because I know that you want Tyler's insights very badly. I do. Put yeah. the clock back up to 60. This is the first time in history that Tyler's ever flaked out. It's okay. We're going to give Tyler a pass. You get a second shot at it, which is good for you, right? It's an extra practice round. Yeah. Okay, you ready, Ian? I'm ready. Kyle, you're paying attention. Are you sure you want to do it with that shirt on? What are you talking about? It's a beautiful blue okay, shirt. Okay, go ahead. I'm just checking. Oh, now Tyler, oh, now you're paying attention to the shirt. You didn't pay attention to the whole pitch last time, and now you're obsessing over it that beautiful like dark blue like shirt. It looks like he's flying a plane. I like it. Go ahead. Oh, oh he just called him a jet blue pilot. It looks like it's a little bit of the jet no, blue the blue. The headphones. The oh, the head with the jet. Yeah, he does look like he's a... Uh, yeah, hi, I'm going to be your captain. You're going to, yes. uh, this is uh, Captain Ian. I'm uh, here. We're going to be flying into Rock, this is yes. the, uh, Rochester to West Palm Beach nonstop. We have some great service <laughs> for you. We're going to have uh, free internet. <laughs> okay, Ian, yeah. you have 60 seconds. And Tyler's Abra. complete attention. Three, two, go. All right, Tyler, I know you're a busy guy. You have a lot of stuff going on, but you're trying to do the right thing and be a good guy and help people out. Um, sometimes things slip by, though. Maybe, like, uh, uh, there was an old lady coming in the door behind you. You didn't see her, closed it in her face. Uh, maybe you missed someone's important pitch or something. Or, you know, maybe you've just been unlucky, but you want to get your good luck going and get back in the karma black. At offsetmykarma.com, that's what we're here for. You Basically, it's like carbon offsets with good deeds and volunteer work. You give us a few dollars, depending on the infraction, five to fifty right now, um, and our karma employees will go out and do some good deeds and volunteer work in your name. It's like sponsorship for your universal standing. Offsetmykarma.com. Let us create some good karma for you. Okay, I can confirm Same. that Tyler was engaged that whole time. I'm looking <laughs> at your website right now. How much karma did you need? Choose your level. Not so bad. Oops. Uh oh. Wow, that's awful. Blah blah blah. Uh, very cute. Tyler, uh, yeah. rate the pitch on a scale of 1 to 10, now that you've paid attention. The pitch. 6.5. 6 to 5. 6 to 5. We're going yes. quarter points now. Uh, I gave the pitch an 8. I totally understood it. Uh, and uh, the product Six, itself? Five. Product itself, um, it, <laughs> it, I there's too many to choose from here. It's like a, um, I felt like the product to me was very similar. It's like, it's like a Big Mac in the Vatican. Inside from Thailand. It's like a Big Mac in the Vatican. Yeah. So, <laughs> Big, let me see if I, I, Big Macs are a religious experience? No. In a certain context? Or the, the Vatican is a place for re religious experiences and Big Mac is not one of them? Or... If you're in the Vatican, you'll be eating those tiny wafers, and that would be Christ, and so the Big Mac is not really Christ-like. Oh, Christ you're really going deep with this one, okay. Or it's like the Da Vinci Code, and yes. the, the Big Mac yes. is like the, the that would be like Jesus' wife. Right. It symbolizes Jesus' wife. You're there with the and, ketchup, yes. And, and the almost, ketchup is there. the crucifixion, <laughs> yes. and the, the guy whips himself, and he rips his back. <laughs> is like happy the, meal the with happy the, meal. You know, french fries. The french fries. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Tyler, unpack that one. Um, it, you're, you're essentially making a very commercial exchange out of a, what is essentially a religious, you know. Ah, I see, um, I see, I see. So you're, you're, com you're, you're commercializing something that which does not, typically right. commercialized. Which is inherently not meant to be commercialized. But there is a dissonance created when you do that. It, it's, <laughs> you know what I like about that, though? I mean, in, 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 in a broad respect, I, that feels odd to me. And, and, and another part of me really likes that. 
Yeah, I like challenging the notion, you know, conventional notions. Of course. I mean, that, I'm, that's me to a T. So I'm really torn on this because my, <laughs> you know, reverend side is like, oh, that, you can't do that. But people tell me all day long all my ideas I can't do. And I'm like, no, I'll show you. Like, right, yeah, yeah, you like no, it. It's different. Yeah, yeah, it's quixotic, right, as we yes. use that term a lot. Um, yeah, I, I think on a business level, hmm, the idea of the business. Now, I'm uh, an investor in something called Belgrave Trust, uh, which, if you take a look here, uh, let you shop for uh, eco-friendly choices. So if I want to, I can buy a sticker to put on the back of the laptop, and I just bought like five of these to give to people, and I gotta put one on the back of this one, but if you see that little, if you see that symbol, that means that this MacBook has been sustained. Uh, basically, put the extra two leaves in, and you put the sticker on top of your existing thing, and that means they've car you've carbon offset for 10 bucks your laptop. Um, so I love this idea of you know, it's, it's, that's, that one is like a Big Mac in the Vatican because it's consumption matched with something virtuous um, and using design as a, as a way to do it. So I think that I love mm -hmm. your idea. I love it. And for me, if, it, it feels like Kiva for, um, it, it's almost like it gives you another way, to, it gives you like a fun entry point to Kiva. But instead of doing yeah. a school or you know, I'm buying somebody a goat or chickens for an egg farm in you know, some other country, I feel like with this, hey, I am doing um, something more interesting. Like I am going to give $10, and that $10 is going to go to somebody who is uh, teaching an after-school program, right? And I can yeah, pay for exactly. one hour of after school. Now, you have to close the loop on this because right now it feels like you're going to just right. take all this money and put it in your pocket. Yeah, that's um, something people have wondered about too i mean friends and stuff we haven't gone doing a lot of advertising and stuff but yeah yeah you need to have official things that we can connect with so what i would do is i find an after school right. program that costs 20 bucks an hour to run and i would say we're going to try to do this after school program for 10 hours a week and you can offset your karma at any time and tweet it and then post it to my facebook i would do it and i would give it as a gift which is my was mm -hmm. my advice to the guys over at uh, belgrave trust which just redesigned their site it's beautiful and i said you know this um, live well, uh, you know, this sort of shopping for green stuff, they made that the top piece. And boy, has, have things, when they made that the focus, people are actually getting more engaged. And they've got some really cool stuff coming. Um, uh -huh. like, can you imagine if there was a, um, well, I can't say because, yeah, I'm an investor. But anyway, <laughs> there's things you might want to offset that they could design something for. So I, I Ooh, give the cool, business, yeah. like, I, I'm going to bring the pitch down to a seven, but I'm going to bring the business up to a seven and a half, eight. I think the pitch... Okay. The, the one thing that was lacking from the pitch, I would say, is you had, we, got, you, we got authentic founder passion. You explained it yeah. properly. We didn't get compelling examples. That was mm -hmm. really the main thing. So your examples were, like, very forgettable. Like, oh, you know, it could be <laughs> like you spit on the ground or you didn't hold the door. I, I, you have to have more real examples. So what I would do if mm -hmm. you were pitching this again is I would actually have, there's an after-school program uh, in Minnesota. Uh, it's run by a woman named Susan. And, you know, they just had their funding cut. And it only costs $25 an hour to run this. And it's only 1,000 hours a year. So what we've done is, every time you want to do something nice for the world, your car, you want to make sure your karma is good, you go here, you pay $25, you just put 12 kids into an hour of after school. That's 12 kids not on the street. For $25, $2 a kid, you can feel great. And if you just want to give $2 because mm. you did something, whatever, you can give it to somebody else. Like, that would be like the more compelling example. Get us vested in your example of why you yeah. built it. That's that connection, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well done. Uh, congratulations. Keep listening. And uh, we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Thanks. He did great. Thank you, MailChimp, for sponsoring the show. If you have a question and you're ready to go on the shark or you're ready to go on the shark tank, just email Ask Jason at This Weekend. Follow us this weekend. I'm oh, sorry. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWI Startups. If you want to follow Tyler, go to www.twitter.com slash steep decline, as in the economy is going down a steep decline. But now that the economy's up, what do you do? I stick by my... Uh, Irrational exuberance? <laughs> yeah, that would be my new email handle, yeah. Uh, subscribe at youtube.com slash show slash TWI Startups. YouTube.com slash show slash TWI Startups. Type in This Week in Startups when you're on um, Facebook, when you're on the Facebook. Just type in This Week in Startups. We have a page there, mm -hmm. and there's hundreds of us hanging out there putting clips, so that's where the clips go on the Facebook. It's the Facebook.com. No, it's Facebook.com. Just do the search box. It's easier. Uh, well... There we go. Show number 124 in the can. See you next time. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't
going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you. Yeah, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah, we ain't going to live like equals until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you.